charge? I am spent. Uh, you know, I would think I, I have covered uh, a couple of Comic Cons in my day, and when I see people running around, especially a guy in your position, because to be honest, I mean, it might exist without you, but it isn't what it is without somebody from Star Trek. And George Takei is, in fact, Star Trek to a lot of people. Would you agree? Yeah. Thank you for saying that, and thank you for that applause. But, you know, I wouldn't be George Takei without all of you. It's your dedication to the, to the show and to uh, all the various generations of Star Trek that's made Star Trek into this incredible 46-year-old phenomenon. So thank you all for all your support and undying love. Uh, let me just say this, without you, I'd be talking to myself. So now we're all cool. Uh, now, George, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, we're going to open up the floor to questions. So I, I actually, I'm a bit nervous. It's been a long time since I've been nervous. But you put a microphone in my hand, I'm comfortable. Yes, but, well, you're here's not what I want to make sure you know. I'm a huge fan of yours, and I want to make sure not to use up any of the questions that these lovely young people might have for you. But you have been in sci-fi, much like the country song go, I was in the country before country was cool. You were in the sci-fi decades before Star Trek, were you not? Well, to be like frank, Christmas I Christmas. read people like uh, Ray Bradbury, sure. but I wouldn't say I was into uh, sci-fi. Then who was it that dubbed the voices in the 50s oh, and man. wrote that? Oh, oh man. Yes. yes, score one for Bonanucci right there. <laughs> yes, I did do um, the uh, English uh, dubbing on this Japanese movie, Rodan. And then there was another one uh, that... Big that Rodan, you guys! I mean, talk about your Comic-Con. This is... Captain Kirk was a twinkle in his mother's eye. <laughs> and uh, one... Uh, another movie, Japanese sci-fi sci movie that I dubbed into English, they later called Godzilla. So... Uh, in that sense, I was involved with uh, sci-fi back then. Now, did you do, did you actually translate from Japanese into English, or just done? I, I did not do the translating. Uh, we had writers who did the translating, and we did the dubbing. However, some of the translations that the um, writers gave us didn't work. It wouldn't fit the lip movement. Well, that, that, can I tell you the truth? That has not changed. Huh? No. I like, I like saying this uh, a great deal, but it makes it sound a little closer than we actually are. But I'm relatively good friends with Jackie Chan. Uh, and this is now 2012, and I'll still see Jackie's movies, and I'll see better than our kung fu. <laughs> so they haven't really tracked up with that kind of dubbing. But now it's 2012. Did you ever suspect? that you would still be adored by these, I mean, legions of fans. If I'm not mistaken, you have 1.3 million friends on Facebook? Believe it or not, I still don't believe it. It's amazing. But you know, when I first started with uh, the uh, pilot of Star Trek, uh, we knew we had a quality show. The writing was all there. The ideas were all there. And I was chatting with Jimmy Dewan, and I said, I smell quality with this show. It is going to be a show that we're going to be proud of. Jimmy Dewan would play Scott. So, uh, Jimmy Dewan. But then I added on, I don't think we'll last too long. Good shows don't last on television. Which would explain why the Partridge family was on longer than Star Trek. Yes. <laughs> Good shows don't last that long. But it was a brilliant show. Let me ask you, and I think we should turn it right over to the audience. For 46 years of success, wouldn't you have think mathematically you would have had to have bigger success? I mean, Star Trek by today's standards, forget the audience members because there's so many channels, but by today's standards, Star Trek was not a hit. No, it wasn't. At the beginning of each episode, we announced that we were going, boldly going, on a five-year mission. Well, we met Klingons, we met Andorians, all sorts of adversaries, but we didn't think that uh, those adversaries would overcome us. What we didn't know was that we had adversaries called NBC programming executives. <laughs> they aborted us after three seasons. So it did run three seasons. Can three you seasons. imagine, we're all here 46 years later for a, a show I don't think most of us could probably still do dialogue from. And it was only on three seasons. 
we could quote the show, and most of us a little bit better than Shatner. That's just a personal <laughs> opinion. Uh, no big deal. Don't, don't get upset with me. But, um, I, and then I'm going to turn it over right after to you. Do you think there's any truth to the curse that nobody that had a, fa a fake foreign accent on the show went on to the success of the people who did not have... Jimmy Doohan, who played uh, Scotty, and the man who played Chekhov, has not had the kind of success that the other characters on Star Trek have had. Well, particularly Jimmy. He's no longer with us. Okay. That's well. <laughs> Depending on how you look at things, that's even a big win and a big loss. All right, who's got a question, a question for George Takei? It's fairly dark, so you should make your presence known by screaming, bursting into flames, whatever you'd like to do. While we wait for a question, George, how do you feel about the latest uh, Star Trek renditions? The J.J. Uh, Abrams uh, yes. movies. I thought it was a terrific movie movie. I mean, it really had pace and rhythm and action, you know, and it had to be done with a younger cast. All that running that they did in the corridors of the Enterprise. I don't, I can't imagine Bill Shatner running. I mean, I'm terrified of that picture. <laughs> Say your phrases for stun, and then just let him go. Yes, your question over here. I have two questions regarding allegiance. Yes. So first of all, did you... Um, Where are you? I'm over here. Oh, there you are. Yes. So did you write it? And two, are you singing in it? If you are, can you sing us something? <laughs> well, uh, it began in a prophetic way. When uh, Brad and I are in New York, we're in the theater almost every night. We are theater buffs. We're dedicated theater buffs. And one, one night, yeah, well, there are kindred souls here. One night, we were, uh, we got to the theater kind of early. We sat down and we were talking about the play that we had seen the night before. And there were two guys sitting in front of us. And one of them recognized my voice. He turned around and said, George, George, you're George Takei, aren't you? And we, uh, you know, chit-chatted for a while. And then the play began. And during the intermission, we chatted some more. We thought they were nice guys, very friendly. The next night, we went to see um, um, In the Heights, a, um, a musical about uh, the Puerto Ricans in uh, New York, living in, um, in uh, Washington Heights. And um, we arrived at the theater. This time, the theater was fairly full. But again, not in front of us, but in the same row that we were in, where those two same guys about four or five seats uh, away from us. And these seats were occupied, so we just kind of waved to them. And we said, what a coincidence. You know, same guys, two nights in a row. And uh, then the play began. Uh, and if you know the play, near the end of the first act, the father uh, has a song called Inuti, or Useless. He wants to do so much for his daughter, but because of the economic conditions, and some of the barriers that uh, Puerto Ricans uh, face in New York, he couldn't do all that he wanted to do for the love uh, for the daughter that he loved so much. And uh, he sings this song, uh, "Useless." And for some odd reason, that reminded me of the time that uh, we were in the uh, Arkansas and German camp during sec the uh, Second World War, and it reminded me of my father, who wanted to do so much for us. For the, for the kids, uh, myself, my younger brother, and my baby sister. And it got to me so much that I, you know, I'm a softie at tear triggers. I started to cry. And then wouldn't you know, the act would end and the lights would immediately come on blazing and the intermission would start. And I was, you know, wiping my face when the two guys came over uh, to chit chat and they saw me, you know, wiping the Ear, uh, the, uh, I, the tears off my uh, face, and he said, how, uh, how, why did that song strike you so profoundly? And I told him about the internment camp. And uh, the guy who recognized my voice the night before, uh, an Asian American, uh, uh, Jay Kuo is his name, uh, said, um, the story of the internment sounds like uh, uh, something that would be important to do as a drama on, uh, on the stage. And uh, I said, well, I'm 
planning on uh, writing uh, the last part, uh, the, the first third of my autobiography as a uh, television drama, he said, no, no, it'd make a great music, uh, musical. And it turned out he was a composer lyricist. And uh, uh, so we chatted just briefly during the intermission. And uh, then, you know, the act, second act began. Uh, and we went back to our seats. But after the play, we uh, went out for drinks together and we talked about it some more. And he was very persuasive. It turns out he's a, a composer lyricist who had a musical on in San Francisco at that time. And uh, we uh, talked about the idea of doing a, a story on the internment uh, as a musical. And uh, so we decided to meet the following night for dinner instead of going to the theater. And we talked about it some more. And we uh, got really excited about that idea. But those two guys were from San Francisco. We're from Los Angeles. We went back. But I started a, uh, email correspondence with uh, Jay and uh, we sketched out the drama and then about two weeks later he sent a song over the internet I mean you know I'm of the radio generation and I'm still astounded by all of the uh, uh, all that can be done uh, uh, online and uh, the song that he sent over was titled Allegiance and it was about the father wanting to do so much for his children in an internment camp. And there I was, seated at my computer, bawling away again. And it really affected me. And so from that, we started developing it. And uh, uh, the other guy happens to be a writer as well. And so uh, he and Jay uh, collaborated in the writing. I uh, gave them uh, guidance on the uh, factual stories of the events of the internment. The story is uh, fictional. We didn't, uh, I was too young to really understand the events uh, as a uh, five-year-old well, child. I just was reading about this because I find the uh, internment camps a very interesting part of American history. But in an article you recently did, you said, uh, when I would run off from my, my camp to use the latrine at night, I thought it was very nice of the soldiers to light my way. And you had no idea because you were only five. They were just making sure you didn't escape. Right. Just, now, when you go to talk about, and the question was about a musical George Takei is writing about, uh, called Allegiance, about his youth spent, uh, his very early youth spent in an internment camp. Do you think you can take a, um, a topic that is, in, in, in my opinion, not only dark, but a fairly shameful time in American history, and make it into a musical and have people standing up and cheer? And the second part of that question is, I just want to tell you this. Two guys meeting up with two other two guys in a musical theater a couple nights in a row, not big of a coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> so, do you think I maintain it was prophetic. It was prophecy. We were, we were, somebody was pulling the strings for us to meet together. I believe we have more questions on this side of the room. Well, you asked right? him something about the dark story. Yeah, do you, do you, think, it, yeah, do you think you can make that into people leaving the theater going, I mean, obviously you can make it into people thinking, that was an amazing night out. The musical well, let me cite amazing. a few examples. Please. La Miserable, great Broadway hit, is about the French Revolution. Oppressed people, you know, being subjugated to horrors of the French uh, uh, government and, uh, and the uh, revolution. That's a dark story. If you, let you me get, cite problem. another example. Miss Saigon, about the Vietnam War. Let me cite an even darker story. Sweeney Todd. <laughs> a murderous barber who slits the throat of his uh, uh, customers and then sells the body to his neighbor lady, who is a baker, who bakes the meat of those people into meat pies, and they become very popular in London. They sell like meat pies. Meat pies. <laughs> And you guys thought that the one from Hunger Games was going to be the gory battle. <laughs> All right, now let's go for that question over here. And, and by the way, a more than sufficient answer on that question. Thank you very much. Uh, question over here, please. Hi. Um, I was wondering, going back to your Japanese roots, do you ever get to speak Japanese now, nowadays? Does, does your husband get to speak Japanese with you? My husband 
is terrible with languages. <laughs> yeah, I, I sometimes have to teach him some English words. <laughs> so you've tried to teach him? I've taught him some Japanese words, and when he's in Japan, he tries to use them, but he always gets into horrible troubles with them. So what I did was I decided I'm going to teach him uh, a phrase that will already get him into trouble from the beginning. So I taught him the Japanese phrase, Boku wa baka. <laughs> Some of you understand. <laughs> For some reason, you told your husband to say that he was stupid. You, you understand Japanese too. Uh, uh, <laughs> I'm okay. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> That's two for the new chief. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have a, a, a friend of mine uh, who served as the Secretary of Transportation uh, in the Bush administration named Norm Minetti. That's a Japanese name. But people think he's Italian. When the Italian Prime Minister was visiting the White House, Norm got invited to the state dinner, and they thought he was an Italian. <laughs> well, until he showed up. And we have a question for Mr. Takai over here. Takai, rather, over here. Takai. Hello. But Daddy, um, I don't object to Takai. Because that's a legitimate Japanese word, if you know. Yes, it means expensive, I believe. It means expensive. You can call me that anytime and I'll send you a billy. I actually... You got it. Let's get back to Mr. Takei. <laughs> Which doesn't mean cheap, either. So, I have been very greatly enjoying your presence on the internet in the last several years. Specifically, um... much of your work for um, LGBT rights and calling... I'm never gonna get through this sentence. Uh, and calling people douchebags who need to be called douchebags. Because let me tell you, just the clip of you saying you're a douchebag gets sent to so many people. Um, but we felt, my boyfriend and I, although we are not GLBT, we are very supportive, we felt that your message of it's okay to be decay could be said in a more fabulous manner. So to that end, we made you this sash. You made George Takei a sash? It says you it's okay to, to be you want Takei. Me to so you can open it and close it again. Anyway, so if you ever want to come to a Huskies game and be supportive of Takei rights, you're set. Well, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Supportive of Takei rights. That, there's important and there's really important. Well, you know how this all began. No, and I'm dying here. There is, in Tennessee, a politician named Stacy Campfield who is, I mean, ridiculously homophobic. He introduced a bill which the uh, state senate passed, uh, which criminalizes the use of the word gay by school teachers, of all people. I mean, school teachers are the ones that most need words uh, to help young, young people who are starting to feel certain uh, things in, in their body and their system. And you know, they need to be able to give them some counseling and guidance. And the word gay is a necessary word to use. But to criminalize them and put teachers that use the word gay into jail for a week is outrageous. And uh, so I said, well, if, that, uh, if the word gay is uh, going to be criminalized, then they can use a word that rhymes with gay as a substitute. My last name is pronounced Takei, which rhymes with gay. So I said, then, then uh, when you need to use the word gay, just say the word Takei, like marching in a Takei pride parade. <laughs> And then at Christmas 
time you can sing Don't me now I took a year I mean, they are ridiculous, and they're so easy to lampoon, these, these Tennessee politicians. However, it passed the Senate, and now it, uh, it's being debated in the uh, lower house, and uh, the, the governor, God knows what a Tennessee governor would do, but he could sign it. So we want to nip it in the bud before it does that. So we want to make fools, really absolute uh, fools out of these uh, uh, Tennessee politicians, and ridicule them to death. I would just like to point out that our governor, in all her infinite wisdom, said that gay marriage is not only cool, but legal. So let's, you know... <laughs> I don't have a sash, but... Uh, <laughs> and you know what? I have like three. Just don't tell my friends. <laughs> um, you know, I'm a fan of all of your work and definitely with your work with uh, LGP, LGBT uh, rights, but actually the one thing I tell any of my friends who are on Facebook is to start following George Takei because it'll be the best decision they make all year. And thank you. I, I wanted to ask you, um, if all the posts you do, I mean, some of which are about, you know, important issues, but many are just awesomely hilarious, if they are all ones like you do or if someone else helps you also, and if they are yours, like how much time do you spend on that and what's the process and everything? Because there's a lot of posts and they're all really good. Well, the thing is, I have so many wonderful, funny people who send me uh, cartoons and jokes and ideas. You know, so uh, uh, we get to pick and choose from the wonderful ideas that we get, uh, or cartoons that we get sent, or photos that we get sent. And uh, Brad and I were doing it, but now it's become a, a tsunami of suggestions and, and submissions from people. So uh, we've had to, to take on a couple of interns and I'm sorry that I have to shatter that illusion. <laughs> I have a quick question for you, George, and that is, you have become one of, and boy, you are a, a brilliant strategist, or just the luckiest guy in the world, uh, one of the two, and in this business it's best to be both, but the, uh, I'm of the impression, if you listen to my voice, I can do no impressions. People, much like you said, somebody recognized my voice. I can yell for my wife or one of my kids, and I can hear somebody in aisle 12 go, I think I just heard Danny Bonaduce. <laughs> but the other day, I just was kidding around, and I said, Oh, Bob. <laughs> you and I went, hey, that's George long. Takei. That's George Takei. So apparently I can do one impression, and it's you. And the question is, did you even start that, or did somebody else start that about you, and you picked it up, the oh my? I've been saying, oh my, all my life, you know? <laughs> and right. when I started um, appearing on uh, the Howard Stern Show, occasionally, <laughs> occasionally, you know, he, he would say some outrageous things. Howard? Howard saying outrageous things? Imagine, imagine that. <laughs> and the only way you could respond to those statements were, oh my. <laughs> He had it on tape, and so even when I'm not there, he plays it. He says something outrageous, and he presses a button, and it plays, oh my. <laughs> and so Howard Stern is the man who made it my signature, not me. I just say it all the time, but he's the one that made it uh, a broadcast phenomenon. I guess uh, that you and I both have something coming. We both have to thank Howard Stern a little bit for helping out in our careers. A, a very good friend of mine. Even though for a while we were competitors, I never once didn't say thank you to the guy that got the ball rolling. And as long as you're gracious, he, he's a pretty cool guy to deal with, isn't he? Cool. A question over here for Mr. Decay. Uh Yeah, I was just going to say, you have some really fantastic branding. I don't know a lot of people that would spurn this room to be filled or... Uh, some of my friends are actually walking around with a Takai, a Takai, uh, Pride Parade banner, actually. Um, <laughs> awesome! I was just going to say, you've done some endorsements before, like Touch of Color televisions. Um, do you get approached for a lot of promotions? Are there any that you've turned down? There are many that we turned down, but one that has been uh, very successful and remunerative 
Um, I did uh, two years ago. Um, it's it's called Sharp Television, and uh, if you saw that, I borrowed from Howard Stern, and it ends when I see this picture of uh, Sharp's Quatron TV. I am amazed, astounded, and blown away, and I say, Oh my! <laughs> Uh, can we look forward to any more Star Trek movies in the future? As a matter of fact, the, the, as we speak, film. they are filming right now. I think they're in to their third month filming. And that Star Trek movie, the 12th Star Trek movie, will be released in May of 2013. Have to wait another month. I mean, another year. Another year. And Have you ever been approached about uh, making a cameo in any of these, or would you like to? Uh, a cameo in that movie? In the new ones that are coming out? Oh, well, up. Leonard uh, made a cameo in the first one, and I thought they would uh, include the still living one of us uh, in the, the subsequent ones, but I think they made a policy decision. They're going to try to get away from uh, uh, that confusion and the, uh, the uh, story track, you know, of uh, bringing an old, ancient... Uh, Spock back, and so the, uh, they don't have any cameos from any of us in the next one. And from what, what I understand, should there be another J.J. Uh, Abrams, Abrams uh, Star Trek movie, uh, it will be without any of us. Well, I, I, I must say, I, on my personal feelings, if that's a, a mistake in judgment, but a lot of people would come up to I think you should be the producer of the next Thank one. Thank you. But, uh, I'm not just saying that because you're sitting right there, although it helps. Of course you uh, are saying that. No, I mean, I, like I said, I'm a fan. I've been a bunch of people come to you all, uh, come up to you all the time and say, Lieutenant Sewer, and if, if I'm not mistaken, you were promoted to captain in 1993, were you not? The only one of the regular cast who got a promotion to his own captaincy on his own ship that is bigger than the Enterprise. Mr. Kikane, first off, I'd like to say Baba Booey to you all. Oh, thank you. And, uh, Baba Booey right back to you. Thank you, sir. Uh, two questions. Um, one, can you say dry oatmeal and musculature? <laughs> and secondly, when can we hear your wonderful voice and uh, presence on the Howard Stern Show again? Well, uh, I think there should be uh, an explanation for uh, uh, dry oatmeal. Uh, you know, that show begins very early in the morning, and we have to report to the studio like at 5 o'clock, a.m. in the morning. And so we get our breakfast there at the studio. The um, uh, interns hand it to us as the, the show's uh, running. And one morning, I always order uh, oatmeal and fruit salad. And one morning, the uh, oatmeal that was delivered to me was uncooked and no milk in it. But the show's going on, so I, you know, you can't uh, uh, stop the show and ask for uh, cooked regular oatmeal. And I was hungry, so uh, I was munching on dry oatmeal. And it got caught in my throat. And I started to hack. <laughs> and then Howard said, you know, what's the matter with you? And I, I, all I could get out was, dry oatmeal. <laughs> And he had uh, that on tape, and so he kept playing that over and over again. So when uh, Oh My dies away, the next th signature is going to be Dry Oatmeal. <laughs> and uh, musculature, I always thought that word was pronounced musculature. I discovered from the know-it-all, Robin Quivers, that is pronounced musculature. But Howard liked musculature, and he's been repeating musculature every time that the word comes up. He is an evil man. <laughs> I, I'll tell you this, George, I, I, I am one of Howard's biggest fans, but it sounds like he's just doing the George Takei show for the last 10 years. Uh, do we have another question for Mr. Takei over here? Hi. From the lady in the horns. What's <laughs> Uh, I want. I just want to say. Konnichiwa, Japanese. I'm only in your one Japanese. So. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you hate that? I shot my whole thing too. Uh, um, I want to 
say yeah, hello and thank you from my whole QSA. You're literally the reason that we were formed. Uh, so we love you so much. And also, you've been my favorite cast member since I was five years old. And I always used to pretend to be you. So I want to know, what's your favorite part that, or on set? What was your favorite part of being on Star Trek? What was my favorite part that was what? Of being like on uh, Star Trek, like uh, behind the scenes. What's my favorite experience that was that happened uh, off screen? Yeah. Uh, that's related to Star Trek. Yes. Oh well, there. Uh, I think she was better off in Japanese. <laughs> <laughs> I remember one. Um, we finished uh, for the, the, the day's work, and we were uh, Jimmy and I, Jimmy Juan and I, were walking uh, back to our cars. And um, Jimmy said, uh, I have no dinner plans, do you? And I said, no, as a matter of fact, I don't either. And he says, well, let's do something. And I said, uh, okay, what do you feel like? Uh, and he said, well, I don't know, what do you feel like? Uh, and I, I said, uh, well, what about going to a sushi bar? And he says, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> this was yeah, back in the 60s. I was going to say, 60s. what year is this? Yes, back in 1965 or 66. And uh, you know, uh, sushi wasn't known at all. And uh, as a matter of fact, when I first said sushi, uh, Jimmy said gesundheit. <laughs> <laughs> and so I had to explain to him that uh, it's a um, ball of rice with raw fish. And I was a little uh, skittish about telling him it's raw fish, you know, because anything raw, people get kind of squeamish about. And I said, you sit at a bar and you and all I had to, uh, to do was say, you sit at a bar. Jimmy said, a bar? Good, let's go there. <laughs> so we drove down to uh, Little Tokyo, to uh, a bar that, a sushi bar that no longer exists. But uh, uh, we walked in and I introduced him to sushi. He took to it like a fish to water. <laughs> he loved it. And the next day, uh, back on the set, he was telling everybody about this fantastic dining experience and the way he talked to people about it. You pick this thing up and you put it in your mouth and you run your tongue, run your tongue over it and it's fleshy and you just, you just run it over it and then you bite softly into it. <laughs> And he piqued the curiosity of uh, people. And so they all came, uh, came up to me and said, George, let's go down to that bar that Jimmy's talking about. <laughs> and I said, well, let's do it on Friday night, you know, because uh, we want to relax. And uh, on weeknights, you know, we got to get go to uh, bed early. So that Friday night, we had about three cars going down the Hollywood freeway to Little Tokyo. And they all fell in love with it. Uh, a major uh, baron. Major Barrett Ro uh, Roddenberry what? was one of them, and she was started talking about it. And before long, every Friday night, we had a caravan of about six or seven cars, and we took over that whole sushi bar. And uh, so, uh, but one person that never joined us on that was Walter Kamen. But because everybody was talking about it, Walter came up to me and said, you know, I don't like raw things, but they make it sound so interesting. Uh, can I stick with you when we go down there and have you give me some guidance? And so I said, oh, uh, sure. Uh, in fact, you can ride with me. And uh, we uh, went down to Little Tokyo with uh, all the other people. And Jimmy, by this time, was sitting at the other end of the bar telling people what to order. Oh, yeah, that's salmon, that's tuna, that's mackerel, and oh, this is better. You'll like this better. And Walter was uh, sticking very close to me. And I said, uh, I told him the first one to start out with might be tuna because that's very much like beef. I think you'll like that. He says, well, I like my beef cooked. And he says, well, you don't, this is sushi. You don't eat it cooked. You got it. The whole reason for you to be here at a sushi bar is to eat it the way sushi should be eaten. So he said, well, all right, I'll try it. And I told him, you, uh, you get your uh, sushi and I, oh, I ordered the same thing. And I demonstrated for him how to eat it. And so um, Walter tried to pick it up with his 
uh, chopsticks and he was very fumbly. So I said, well, um, you, you can get away with it. You look like you could get, uh, get away with it. Pick it up with your fingers and, and put it in your mouth. And so he picked it up and he kept staring at it, <laughs> turning it around. And then he sort of sniffed at it. And then he put it in his mouth and closed his mouth on it. And then all, all of a sudden I saw his eyes pop open and you know, he stopped his mouth was frozen and I thought, oh my god, I, fought, I forgot to tell, to tell him about wasabi. <laughs> he opened his mouth, got his napkin, spat it out, all out, and he started to hack. And, his, and tears ran out, out of his eyes. His nose ran. And I think the wax in his ears popped out. <laughs> the poor guy. He never joined us on a sushi expedition again. <laughs> well, I gotta tell you, Little, little Tokyo is a side street in downtown Los Angeles. We're talking in the 60s. Can you imagine going out to dinner in the 60s and going, Dude, I swear to God, I think I see the entire cast of Star, uh, Star Trek over there. Don't look, don't look! I think they're all over there. You see? That's, a, that's, an, that's an amazing story. By the way, uh, before I get to a question over there, I'd just like to tell you, I've had uh, the pleasure of eating sushi uh, all over the world, and I would say Seattle is some of the finest fish. You're right. You're right. You're right. <laughs> Excellent fish. Question right here for, for Mr. Uh, Takei. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to ask Mr. Takei about one of my favorite moments in Star Trek and television history. I want to know, could you and me a topless sword fight at one point? Ever have a topless sword fight? <laughs> uh, let me take have, have a look at your top. <laughs> You're in the dark, I can't tell. <laughs> Meet me backstage later. <laughs> For another question, right, right here, this young lady or gentleman, I can't. It's quite dark right there. I'm a dude. Hey, man. <laughs> Don't feel bad. I made that mistake before. Hey, Jordan. Um, I know we owe a, a debt of gratitude to Lucille Ball and Desi Lou Studios and eventually Paramount. But um, back to Desi Lou. Do you have an anecdote regarding your guest spot on Mission Impossible with Barbara Bain? And part two of my question is, would you like to go see the Seattle Men's Chorus as my guest tomorrow? Uh, tomorrow night? He's busy sword fighting this guy <laughs> with his shirts on! Your dance card must be full, man! I, I, uh, you know, yesterday I did uh, a fundraiser for Washington uh, United for Marriage. Uh, they, they <laughs> You have marriage equality on paper so far, but there are these homophobes that are relentless and they want to overturn that. And so um, there's a major campaign going on to raise funds to fight uh, or uh, nip it in the, in the bud. And uh, so we went to that, but we went to that because all we did yesterday was uh, uh, press to promote uh, the weekend. I gotta tell you, it is very exhausting to write your name over and over and over again all day long. We are spent and I think after tomorrow I am going to be ready for an early dinner and early bed. So the the Beatles. I'll, I'll, I'll take a rain check on that. And our, how's about a, a Mission Impossible or oh, yes. main anecdote? Yeah, I'm curious about that myself. Well, you know, uh, Mission Impossible was filmed right in the uh, soundstage next door to the ones where uh, we had the uh, uh, Bridge of the Enterprise set. And so um, the uh, Mission cast visited us regularly on, on our uh, soundstage, and we visited them regularly. So, you know, we were like uh, compatriots. And um, then one day I got an invitation to uh, do a guest shot on that show. But it was like, uh, you know, uh, visiting your neighbors. Uh, I knew Barbara Bain and, uh, and Marty Landau, Peter Graves, uh, Greg Morris, and so it was uh, uh, a lot of fun uh, working with them. I don't remember anything uh, 
anecdotal to share with you. But um, then when we were canceled, uh, Leonard became a regular on that show because that uh, at Mission Impossible was not canceled. And so uh, uh, we had- Marty and Barbara were canceled. Mar Marty and Barbara what? Were canceled. Yes, that's Marty right. They, they went to uh, London to do um, that other show. What was it? Uh, Space 1999. 1990. That was supposed to be futuristic. <laughs> Is that something? And here we are living in the future already today. As You know, that's, we really are living in the science fiction world because all of the amazing technology that we had on Star Trek that was supposed to be the future. For example, you know, we walked all around that, star, uh, that starship with this incredible device attached to our hip. And where, wherever we were on the starship, whenever we wanted to talk to someone, we'd rip that off, flip it open, and start talking. Astounding, no cords attached to it. Today, in our lives, that amazing science fiction device has become a real nuisance in our world. <laughs> you know, we are living in a science fiction world. And it's just a short off. It takes pictures, we make uh, restaurant reservations, we buy movie tickets. It's an amazing device and we are now in that science fiction world. Do you think that the uh, science fiction of the past has had the influence on shaping the science of today. Because if you notice, um, uh, let's see, what was the, uh, not Buck Rogers, but before Buck Rogers. Uh, space Patrol. Space Patrol. Buzz Corey. Have you noticed Happy. how much spaceships looked like the space shuttle 30 years before there was a space shuttle? It's my theory, and, and I just want to get your opinion on it, that young people who then go to school and study science and technology get impressed upon them, visions from their youth, in some cases, Star Trek, and sometimes before that, and then they make our current technology to fit the memory they already have, because things do look similar to things you have. Every day devices that are advanced technology look incredibly like the equipment you already carried on Star Trek 35 years ago, 38 years ago. Do you think that your shows and shows like it of the past actually shape the technology of the future? You know, I think Gene Roddenberry, who created Star Trek, was a change agent. Because with his imagination, he visualized the future and made that a goal, a benchmark. And other change agents, like the inventors, the engineers, the scientists, the technicians, you know, took that as a goal to strive for. And they, with their genius, made that a reality. So it takes someone with the kind of um, imagination and creativity that Gene Roddenberry had to place a goal in the future. And then that future becomes our commonplace, our everyday, current. amazing phenomenon. I, I, I believe that you are correct. Yes, we have a question for Mr. Takei over here. Well, actually it's not a question. It's actually a thank you. My husband who couldn't be here today he wants to thank you for your wonderful body of work. And he wanted to see the future adventures of Captain Soup. You know, so do I. <laughs> I thought, after Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country, that was the most obvious opening for a Starship Excelsior series, you know with, of course, Captain Sulu in, in that center power chair. And uh, I think a lot of fans thought so too. And they started writing in, and the, uh, the letters that came in, in those days, you know, it was put into a, an envelope written by, uh, uh, by this machine called a typewriter. <laughs> and we put a 13 cent stamp on that envelope and dropped it into the mailbox. And two or three days later, you know, the recipient got that message. And in this case, it was NBC. Uh, they were advocating for uh, a new series. And it was the most logical and the smartest thing to do. But Paramount exa executives or NBC executives are not being, uh, are not known for being logical and smart. 
never happened. It was the most obvious thing, and it never happened. Uh, when I saw that last scene in uh, Star Trek VI, where, um, you know, the, the last scene of all Star Trek uh, uh, stories take place on the uh, bridge of the Enterprise, and the captain gets up from his seat and looks up at that uh, view screen, but this time there's that giant view of Captain Sulu there, and uh, Captain Kirk essentially sit looks up to that figure and says, Thank you for saving my ass. <laughs> and Captain Sulu looks down and says, in essence, Good to see you in action one more time, Captain. <laughs> and he smiles and he roars off. And you see the great ship, Starship Excelsior. And uh, McCoy is looking after that ship and says, By God, that's a big ship. <laughs> but Scotty, with a twinkle in his eyes, says, Hey, but not so big as big, big as had a captain, I think. My Irish accent isn't, or Scottish accent isn't too good. But he says, I not so big as had a captain, I think. Now that's a Captain Sulu movie. That's a Captain Sulu movie right there. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, there are lots of panels coming through. Can we hear from the